Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I have a special program coming up for you. I have Rick Renner, who is my special guest today. He is an expert in the Greek language and also biblical history, Christian history. And we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare. This is a huge issue in the world that we're living in today. And we're going to be talking about how the enemy attacks. And this is something that every believer needs to understand. Before we get into that interview, let me just remind you, if you're not a subscriber to this channel, be sure and subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Also hit the like button. Subscribe means that you're going to get everything that comes out from us. And like means other people are going to find out about it. So be sure and subscribe and like. Here's the interview coming up from Rick Renner. Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I'm very pleased to have joining me on the show today, Rick Renner. He is a highly respected Bible teacher and leader in the international Christian community. He's the author of a long list of books, including the bestsellers, Dressed to Kill, and Sparkling Gems from the Greek 1 and 2, which have sold millions of copies in multiple languages worldwide. Rick's understanding of the Greek language and biblical history opens up the scriptures in a unique way that enables his audience to gain wisdom and insight while learn, learning something brand new from the Word of God. Rick is the overseer of the Good News Association of Churches. He's the founder of the Moscow Good News Church, and he's the president of Good News Channel, the largest Russian-speaking Christian satellite network in the world. He's joining me today to talk about his book, Spiritual Weapons to Defeat the Enemy. We're talking about the issue of spiritual warfare, so important in the day that we're living in. Rick, thank you for joining me today. And we're talking about spiritual warfare, uh, spiritual weapons to defeat the enemy. This is actually an excerpt from your book, Dressed to Kill. So this is the larger book, A Biblical Approach to Spiritual Warfare and Armor. And also you have this book, Life in the Combat Zone. Now you've done the best teaching I've ever read or heard on spiritual warfare. And of course, you're an expert wow. in the Greek. Well, you are. Okay, you're, you're the man. Okay, you're, you're my go-to guy on spiritual warfare. And so I'm glad that, you're, glad that you're with me today. Let's talk about Israel for just a minute because I just want everything that's going on in Israel right now, kind of the big picture. Um, the anti-Semitism in the world right now is shocking. Since October 7th, we have seen, mm -hmm. it was kind of like the anti-Semitism existed and that October 7th just kind of lanced the boil. And now you see all over the world, the other night uh, in the Dallas, Dallas Mavericks basketball game, at the end of the game, they were doing the post-game interviews and Kyrie Irving, who is one of the players for the Dallas Mavericks, came out with a kefia on. Uh, you know, and they never talked about it. They never asked him about it. He never made anything, but he was standing with the Palestinians. So this is something transcending really every sector of society, transcending you know the globe, that we see this polarization of Israel, pro-Israel, anti-Israel. What, what do you think when you look at what's happening right now? Well, it's spiritual. You know, I, I never right. imagined that in our lifetime we would see again what happened in the time of the Holocaust. Yeah. But I mean, what's happening now, the only explanation for this is that this is a spiritual event. That's right. And, you know, regardless of no nation does everything right, I don't care who they are. And that includes Israel. But they are God's people. And we have the promise in Genesis chapter 12 that if you bless Israel, you're going to be blessed. And if you curse Israel, you're going to be cursed. That's just a fact. Yeah, that's right. And I think this is a moment when we need to be very careful what we say about Israel. Yes. We need to make sure we align ourselves biblically with what God says. Otherwise, we will experience something that we don't want to experience. And I'm very aligned with Israel. And I'm praying for peace. Absolutely. When you, when you look at, I mean, you believe we're living in the last days, obviously. You've written books. On Absolutely. I believe we're right at the very end of the last days. Well, that's what I believe. I mean, and we never set dates. And I know we can't set dates. But we see happening right now the impending wars, and now I believe, and this is one of the things I've said, there's the Psalm 83 war, Jeremiah 49 mm -hmm. strike on Iran, there's the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, which is the very famous war, the Gog and Magog war. But at some point, Rick, there's going to be the Antichrist that's gonna step on the stage and make this false peace with Israel. So that that's coming up here. I don't know exactly when to say it's coming up, but it seems as though the world is, stage is set for something like that. I just said to my team this week, the world is waiting for the Antichrist to solve this problem. That's right. 
I mean, he, he is already behind the curtains. He's on stage. He's just waiting for the curtains to part to make his entrance. But we have to be gone first. That's right. And so as soon as we're out of here, bam, he's going to be revealed. Things are, things are changing. Who would have ever imagined the things we are seeing with such rapidity? Yeah. It is just amazing. I was talking to one of my associates yesterday about the next 20 years. He said, you know, it's hard for me to imagine yeah. the world in 20 more years. Yeah. With the way that it's going, can, can we survive 20 more years? And truly, we're living in the very end of the age, Jimmy. I believe it with all my heart. I do too, and I love what you said, because the hope that we have is Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, your redemption is drawing near. So we don't, we don't focus on the news as other people do. Bible prophecy helps us to contextualize so that we don't get mm -hmm. freaked out. And so exactly what you said, I never dreamed I would see a world like this. I never dreamed I would. But we're living in the midst of it. Of course, the Bible said it was gonna happen, but at the same time that's happening, we're looking for the return of Jesus. Uh, the rapture of the church. And, you know, and when you have a grip on the Bible and you know what the Bible says, you're not shaken by these things. That's right. You know, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he told them to quit being so shaked up because of some bizarre prophecies they were hearing. Well, they were listening to the wrong things. Yeah. And right now there's a lot of weird stuff on the internet. You gotta be very careful about what you see on YouTube because there's so many bizarre things out there. Yep. And if people are not rooted in the Bible, which you do so good, of rooting people in the Bible, thank you. If you're not rooted in the Bible, you can literally be blown here and there by everything you're hearing. That's right. And that's why people need your newest book about the end of the age, and tipping, point, tipping point and answers. They're just so rock solid. And it really gives people peace for our times. When you know what's gonna happen, you're okay. Well, thank you, Rick. And so I wanna talk about spiritual warfare. The, the, you said at the beginning of the show, and this is what I say about anti-Semitism, it's spiritual. It's not an ideology, it's a spirit. There's, there's no reasoning right. to it. There's no reasoning to it. You, you can't put a reason behind it, like Hitler, or like what we see with Hamas right now. But we, spiritual warfare is something that people, need, if there's ever been a time that people need to understand spiritual warfare, it's the time that we're living in right now because it is, there, there is an increase, I believe, in the activity in the realm of the spirit. But talk about the word, because in your books, you talk about the word warfare in the New Testament. And of course, you're a Greek expert. I love to hear you explain things in the Greek. What, the, the word warfare, what does it mean in the New Testament? Well, the word warfare, like we all talk about spiritual warfare, it's only really used five times in the New Testament. And every single time it is used, it's used in connection with the mind. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Because the mind is really where the battles are fought. You know, there was a teaching years ago that we needed to rent airplanes and fly into the heavenlies to do spiritual warfare. But, you know, really the highest heights we need to go to is our head. <laughs> because if we can control what's going on here, then we're going to be free. Yeah. If the devil paves a road into our head, he's going to scramble our brains. We're going to be confused. And that's when he begins to build a stronghold in the mind. And from that stronghold, he then begins to take us captive. That's right. And so we just need to take care of our mind. You know, I brought a helmet to show you. This is a real helmet. This is Greek, but this is 2,300 years old. Look at how they were so covered in their mind. They knew their minds had to be protected. And notice that on the back of this, there is like a little shield. And the reason they had a shield on the back of their head is because the enemy carried a battle axe. And this is a real battle axe wow. from, the first, from the first century. And they practically operated this like a boomerang. They would throw it. And if you didn't have that shield on the back of your neck, this would take your head off. Wow. And in the same way, if we don't have the Word of God wrapped around our head, the enemy is after our head. Yeah. That's what he's after. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that God's also after our head? Whoever controls the mind controls our life. That's right. And that's why we're commanded in Scripture to love the Lord our God with all of our strength, all of our mind. Our mind is in there. God wants our mind because if Jesus has our mind, he will sit on our mind like the Lord of our life and he will dominate us. But the enemy also wants the mind. 
And that's why he has weaponized the judicial system, the educational system, the entertainment world from every direction. He's bound, but it's bombarding people's minds yeah. because he wants their minds because whoever controls the head will control your entire life. That's exactly right. And so it's very important that we have the helmet of salvation in place and all the other weapons, which are referred to in Ephesians chapter six. Well, talk about the five, the five key words that explain spiritual warfare in the New Testament. Oh, all right, I'll be happy to. These were very real in my own life. First of all, you have the word uh, wiles. The word wiles is the Greek word diabolos. The word diabolos is a compound of two Greek words. It's the word meta, which means with, and the word hodas, which means a road. When you compound the two words together, it describes one who operates on a road or one who travels on a particular lane. And of course, when you're on a road, it's headed somewhere. It's headed toward the mind. And then you come to the word diabolos, which is the word devil. And it's also a compound word. The word dia means through. It carries the idea of penetration. And the word balos, which means to hit or to repetitiously hit. When you compound the two words together, you find that the name devil really is not a name. It is a job description. It describes what he does. Hmm. He is one who balos repeatedly hits and hits and hits and hits with the intention dia to penetrate until finally he breaks through. So he's traveling on a road, that's the word methods, methodias. He is the devil, he's one that strikes and strikes to penetrate and break into something. And what's he trying to break into? Well, he's trying to break into the mind because the mind is the control center for all of our lives. Yeah. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. That word devices <laughs> is the word noemata, which is a form of the Greek word nous. It's the word for the mind, but it describes a mind that is confused. I call it mind games. And now we find the enemy is headed toward a person's mind. His intention is to penetrate that mind and to so confuse the mind that the person can no longer think correctly. And then this leads us to the next word. And the next word is the word stronghold. He then begins to build a stronghold in our mind. And the word stronghold is the Greek word ukaroma. And it's translated two ways and both ways are correct. First, it is used to describe a fortress in which a king lives. Also a fortress that has walls so thick that those who are on the outside cannot penetrate, they can't get in. Wow. But the same word stronghold, ukaroma, is also the word for a very well-guarded prison. So it either describes a person who's living in a fortress with walls that no one can penetrate or a person who's behind bars wishing that he could be free. And we find that when a person has a mental stronghold, their mind is so seized by the devil. They're living in such a well-defended lie in their head, something about their character or their future, some kind of a lie, that when people want to break through to help them, there's walls there. You just can't seem to penetrate them because they're so encased in a lie, and yet they're behind bars wishing that they could be free. Wow. And then we come to the word in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed. The word oppressed, <laughs> it's a Greek word which describes a tyrant. Well, what does a tyrant do? He lives in a castle. And he tells his subjects what they're going to eat, what they're going to make, what their future is, what taxes they're going to pay. He totally dominates their life and gives them no options. So now we find that once the devil's found his way into the head and built a fortress there, it's nearly like he moves in and from the mind, he begins dominating that person's life, feeding them lies and they listen to it. And the more you listen to the lie, the more enslaved you are by it. Whatever you believe is what you receive. That's just a scriptural exactly principle. Right. Yeah. So if you believe what God's word says about you, 
it will become your reality. If you believe what the devil says about you, it will become your reality. Yeah. And that's why we have to take every thought captive. So when the enemy is pounding our minds, rather than just sit there and be victimized by it, we've got to take that thought captive, cast it down, and choose to open our ear to what the truth says about us. Because the voice that speaks to us is the voice that's going to dominate us. That's exactly. And if you understand that, you basically understand the whole crux of spiritual warfare. It has to do with what goes on inside the head. And may I give you a testimony, Jimmy? Yeah, absolutely. When I was growing up, I had a very bad self-image. I didn't like sports, and all my friends liked sports. I was just wired differently. I liked the symphony, I liked art, I liked museums, I liked culture, and I really thought I was a freak. I thought something was wrong with me. God just made me different. Now I understand. God made me for Russia. <laughs> I didn't do well in school and uh, just really struggled with mathematics. And then I got sick and I missed half of a year of school. And when I came back to school, I was just struggling with me. And there was a voice speaking to me saying, there's something wrong with you. You're not like other people. You're defective. You can't understand mathematics. There's just something defective about you. But my teacher liked me, so she passed me into the next grade. And the next year, I failed again at mathematics. And my teacher again liked me. So by grace, she just passed me into the ninth grade, which was algebra year. <laughs> and when I came into algebra, my teacher was so old, she had been my father's algebra teacher. <laughs> and she didn't like my dad. So the first day I was in class, she said, Ricky Renner, is your dad Ronald Renner? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, any child of Ronald Renner is stupid. And in this class, your name is going to be stupid. Oh, gosh. And every day when she called the role, she called everybody else by their names. And when she came to me, she said, stupid Renner. And I said, here. If I wanted to ask a question, I'd raise my hand. She'd say, yes, stupid. And Jimmy, I did not understand the enemy was literally trying to take my mind captive. Yeah. I'm promising you, I am not stupid. And there's nothing wrong with me. But the enemy knew that God had a plan for my future and was trying to hijack me and take me down before I could get started. He was attacking me from every single side, telling me there was something defective about me, that I wasn't as good as others. And Jimmy, to be honest, the only thing that saved me was I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? And when I received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the power of God hit me and it shattered those lies of the enemy. But I'm going to tell you, I had to still take authority over my thoughts. Yeah. But I understand how the devil operates because he tried to do it to me. And he tries to do it to everybody. But we have weapons. And Jimmy, we have the power of God. That's right. We're not just victims. We have everything we need to keep the devil under our feet. It's that that's where he belongs. Well, that's and that's the good news. Now, every person watching or listening can relate their own story to something because he comes against all of us. It's, it's relentless. Yeah, of course. When I was <clears throat> I was a real large child, I was taller than my second grade teacher. And mm. I, so, I, and I, I was, you know, that much taller than my friends, and I had a big silver tooth. My, I got my my tooth knocked out by a slingshot, and I had this big silver tooth, bigger than should have been. And my brothers called me Bucky the Silver Tooth Beaver, and I remember thinking to myself, "I'm a freak." That that thought came to me one day. I'm a freak, and that thought followed me all through, you know, my youth growing up. And that was something like you were talking about the, the stupid and the attacks against who you are. He does that to every single person. Listen, if you're enjoying this, I want you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And just hit the subscribe button there. And what that means is every time we have something that comes out, you're going to get it. And so that'll, that'll be a blessing to you, but also push the like button and that'll be a blessing to somebody else, which means more people will get this on their feed on YouTube, so hit the subscribe button and the like button. Also, if you want to become a subscriber to endtimes.com, go to endtimes.com, become a subscriber, $7 a month, which means you get our entire program here on your YouTube without any commercials, plus all the podcasts we do, 
all the articles that we have. We have a lot of things that go on on endtimes.com. Become a subscriber for $7 a month. And also, even if you don't become a subscriber, you can give to this ministry. If this has been a blessing to you, go to give.endtimes.com. You can give any gift you want. Nothing's too small, nothing's too large. And you can give a recurring gift, which just means every month regularly you're giving to this ministry. And we want to reach the world with this message. What a mess the world is in today, but the Bible told us exactly what is happening right now would happen. And so we want to get the message out of Jesus, that Jesus is the answer. And also Bible prophecy tells us the future in advance and it comforts people. It helps people to contextualize what's happening in the world so they don't live in anxiety and fear. They live in hope. So help us get this message out. Become a subscriber, give to us and be sure to subscribe to this channel and also like it. God bless you. So, so you talked about taking, taking the, those thoughts captive. Talk about that. When, when the Lord sets you free and you said you had to continue to, to talk, how do you practically, when the devil's attacking your mind, how do you take that captive? How do you overcome that with the Word of God? Well, I was raised as a Baptist and there were lots of things that I was taught very well and I'm so thankful for it. And there are lots of things I was not taught. For example, I'd never been taught that I was righteous. That was a shock to me. I'd never been taught about the authority in Jesus' name. Didn't know a thing about spiritual weaponry. Didn't know anything about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I had to begin to reform the way that I think. And you know, it's amazing. There really is, and you know this, a plasticity to the mind. Right, there is. And if you listen to the wrong information, it will form your mind incorrectly. Yeah. And did you know that's really what the word reprobate means? Really? The word reprobate, the Greek word adukimos is the word which describes a mind which was marvelously made, but has been reshaped or refitted in a wrong way, and now it cannot think right. That's really what the word reprobate means. And there's a lot of Christians, I mean, really saved, but their minds are reprobate because their minds have been wrongly fitted. The plasticity of their mind has been shaped wrongly. They think wrong, they believe wrong, and you can change the way you think but you know what? If you've got a mind that's been affected, you've got to be really committed to change your mind. And this is why a lot of people don't make it. It's not because they can't. It's because they don't have the will to push through. But if you really want to be free and stay free, then you've got to begin to renew your mind to what the Bible says. That's why the word renewing is so important. You're reforming the plasticity of your mind to be shaped differently, to think differently, to form a new world view that you're the righteousness of God in Christ, that you really do have the power of the Holy Spirit, that you've been marvelously created in Christ Jesus. You're not second rate. You're not even a fixed version of who you used to be. You're new. Right. You're brand spanking new. But you got to really bend your brain to take the Word of God into your mind. And honestly, Jimmy, if, if a believer is not reading his Bible every day, he's going to lose the battle. That's right. You've got to bend your brain to the Word of God. I've had moments in later years when my mind was under attack. Jimmy, I bent my brain so hard to the Word of God, I could nearly hear movement in my brain. I was working so hard to submit my mind to what God says. But that's the commitment you've got to have if you want to walk into your freedom, which it's you're free. You may not know it, but you're free because yeah. your mind is telling you that you're not free. Right. But you've got to bring your spirit and your mind into agreement. They've got to come into alignment. That's when everything begins to work out right. But that takes a real commitment to do it. So you said you have to be committed to the Word of God and reading the Word of God. So when Karen and I got married, Karen, Karen grew up my wife, Karen, grew up with a lot of verbal abuse, uh, telling her that she was fat, she was ugly, she was no good, you know, she would never <clears throat> measure up. And so when I married her, very beautiful, uh, she thought she was ugly. She literally believed God couldn't love her. She believed she couldn't be saved. And she was saved, but she constantly just kept going back and forth where she'd be saved. But the thing that she did, Rick, was she read the Word of God every day. We've been married for over 50 years. I've never known a day when she didn't read the Word of God. Now, when she read it, she could believe the bad parts about judgment and about the wrath of God, but she couldn't believe the love parts about being the righteousness of God in Christ and those things.
but she kept reading it. And so, you know, Hebrews 4 says the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And what I tell people is, you read other books, but the Bible reads you. It's, it's a living yeah, Word. That's right. And so when, when the Word of God comes in you, it says no creature can hide from it. And so I, I interpret that to mean when the Word of God comes in, it comes against all the enemies that are in there lying to you. And so, but Karen today is just a, she's a lioness of God. She's, she's just a completely oh, different person. beautiful. And, and I'm the same way. I mean, I was in bondage. There, there was not an area of my life when I got saved that I wasn't in bondage. And exactly what you just said, you have to come against that with the Word of God because it is the most powerful weapon we have coming against the devil's uh, uh, spiritual warfare. Is that right? It is. And in, also in uh, John chapter 16, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll convict the world of sin. Well, we all know that. Yeah. But then Jesus also says he'll convict the world of righteousness. You know what? It takes just as much of a miracle to realize you're righteous as it does for a sinner to wake up to the fact that he's lost. Wow. A sinner doesn't get it. It's like he has no eyes to see, no ears to hear until the Holy Spirit gets involved and suddenly he sees he is in sin. It's, it's a miracle. And in the same way, while you're reading the Word of God and you're trying to understand who you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit goes to work. And the Holy Spirit begins his work of convincing us, you know what? We are really not who we used to be. Yeah. I'm, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. It is a divine revelation. And the Holy Spirit's got to be involved for you to really understand it. And he comes to convince us of righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? It is so wonderful. You know, Re uh, Revelation 12 says that the accuser of the brethren is thrown down. He accused them before God day and night. So the, the devil is the accuser. But one of the things he does is accuse us to ourselves. Is that right? Just, oh, absolutely. Every little thing that we are or aren't or anything. And, you know, it's, you know, here you are a very tall, masculine, powerful man, and you thought that there was something wrong with you. Yeah. Well, think about this. Skinny people who are just convinced that they are fat, so they become anorexic. That's right. What a lie. That's a lie of the enemy in the head. That's right. You know, you can look at them. You can tell them, what are, what are you talking about? But you see, they're in that fortress you almost can't break through to them because they're so encapsulated in a lie. And there they are, actually free. They're feeling like they're behind bars, just wishing they could be different. We really need the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit to walk into our freedom. In your books, this book, Dressed to Kill, and you talk in detail here about the armor of God. Ephesians 6 says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against the spiritual forces and heavenly places. And it says, put on the full armor of God. And it describes it. You showed the, the helmet and the sword there. How do you put on the armor of God? How does a believer practically, you wake up every day prepared to live in the real world and to deal with the devil who's coming against us? How do you put on the armor of God? Well, I have to take you to the Greek if that's okay. Yes. In Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. That word, be strong, is the word enduo. It's where you get the word for an endowment. It's really talking about receiving an endowment of power. Be strong in the Lord, receive an endowment of power. Then you come to verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God. Well, guess what the word put on is? It's the same word translated be strong in verse 10, which means the way that you wear the armor of God is by walking in the power of God. And as long as you're walking in the power of God, You've got a helmet on your head. You've got a breastplate on your chest. You've got a loin belt around your waist. You've got a sword. You've got a shield. But the day that you walk away from walking in the power of God, you begin dropping the armor. And in fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, Paul said to the Ephesian church, that was a great church. He said, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. And Jimmy, I say, that's probably the saddest verse in the New Testament. Because take unto you in Greek is ana labete. Ana means do it again. Labete means to receive it. It means that great church of Ephesus who once walked in the power of God had drifted. Wow. And now the armor, which they once proudly wore, was laying around their feet. And Paul literally said, hey, guys, go back to the beginning. Pick it up. 
pick it up, put it back on you again. And we know because of the usage of the word in duo in verse 10 to verse 11, as long as you're walking in the power of God, you've got everything you need. But the day that you begin to drift or the day that you become kind of spiritually neutral and maybe you begin to backslide and become lukewarm, that those pieces of armor just begin to drop. But when the power of God hits you, it begins to put equipment on you. And so it's essential that we stay in the power of God because that really is what outfits us. So you wake up in the morning, the person watching right now or listening right now, they wake up in the morning. How do they pray a simple prayer that just says, Lord, I received the endowment of power today. I put on the full armor of God today. Is, is that what they do? It's a gift of grace. They don't have to deserve it. I pray for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit every day of my life. Yep. You know, I've had my one experience with the Holy Spirit. There's one baptism. There's many infillings. That's right. And every morning I say, Holy Spirit, I need a new infilling of the Holy Spirit. I need your power. I need your equipment. I need everything that you have to get, give me. And Jimmy, I do it before I ever lift my head off the pillow. Yeah. I don't wait till I go to my secret place to pray. I do it while I'm in bed. Yeah. I need to pray that before my heat fit hit, hit the floor. And so just laying there, I just simply pray. I mean, it's, there's no works involved. It's, it's a, God will give us whatever we'll receive. And that's what I ask for. And that's what your, your viewers can ask for. It's just something that we need so desperately every day. And the good news is he'll give it to us every single day. You know, he will, that, that we ask for. And so talk about, you know, when we talk about spiritual warfare, Rick, we know there's a devil, but there, are, according to Paul, there are principalities, powers, spiritual forces in heavenly places. We know there are demonic powers. Is that something that we need to be thinking about or something that we need to be aware of related to spiritual warfare? I think that when he talks about Ephesians 6, verse 12, he's trying to let us understand that working behind the scenes, there are forces at work. Our wrestle is not against flesh and blood. It's not, with, it's not with what you can see or touch. It's not with your wife. It's not with your husband. Sometimes it's not even about your finances. There's something working behind the scenes. It's like you talked about Israel at the beginning right. of the program. Right. So that's something spiritual. Naturally, this is not explainable. There's something that's not flesh and blood working behind the scenes. And those words in Ephesians 6, verse 12, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, all of those are military terms. And Paul was really telling us, you better be serious yeah, because the devil is highly organized. And you know, years ago, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Rick, the church has more power than the devil. The church has more authority than the devil. And I said, yeah, but Lord, it seems like the devil's winning all the victories. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit answered me and said, you know why? Because the devil has something the church doesn't have. I said, well, what is that? He said, commitment, organization, and discipline. Wow. <laughs> wow. We have power. We have authority. We have the Word of God. Yet the church is disjointed, uncommitted, disorganized. While the devil is just wiping people out, we have everything we need. And if we will just be committed, organized, and disciplined, we will put the devil on the run. You know, Jesus said in Luke 10, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. That's a, Hurt you. It's a, it's a huge statement of protection and authority that we have. And in, in my comment is, we, again, what you say is, why, why are so many believers getting hammered? It's because most, most people, most believers don't believe in the devil. You know, when, when they take polls, a lot of people don't believe in the devil. Well, when you look around the world today, it's hard to deny there's a devil out there and he's evil. And the good news about what I love about your books is you talk in such a, a wonderful, clear way about the devil hates us. He's against us. He's attacking us relentlessly. But we can overcome him every single time if we just stand up to him with the word of God and with the, with the whole armor of God. And just exactly like you just said, we're committed to that. We're organized, we're disciplined, and we realize this isn't just about us, it's about our children, it's about our future, it's about our destiny, 
It's really about everything in our lives. But, but God has given us the authority. And you know, spiritual warfare is not spooky. A lot of people say, oh, it's right. spooky. No, it, there's nothing spooky about it. It's like we talked about at the beginning of the program. If you know what the Bible says, a lot of the mystery is removed and it just gives you a foundation to stand on. You know how to deal with him. You know what you gotta do to fix your brain to think correctly. And if you can get your brain to think correctly, it's, it's gonna come into all of your life. Your health will change, your that's outlook right. will change, that's right. your money will change. It all starts right here and that's why the enemy is after the mind and that's why Jesus wants to be Lord of the mind. That's right. So you talk in your book about Timothy living in a combat zone and Paul was writing to Timothy and the, the, his, T Timothy's worst enemy. Talk about that just a minute. Well, Timothy's worst enemy was fear. He, he was really living in a rough time. We can't deny that. People were dying all around him because of the persecution that erupted during the time of Nero. And by the way, nobody believed that it would have happened because there was religious freedom in the Roman Empire. And so when this started, it really took people off guard. They were stunned. They, they, they probably said, how could, how could this happen? This is the Roman world. We have the guaranteed right of religion and freedom, and bam, suddenly everything changed. And Timothy's church members begin bailing. Many of them begin to die. At one point, even the Apostle Paul fought wild beasts in the stadium in Ephesus. Wow. Wish I could take you there. I could take you right to that place. And it was just quite a shock. And Timothy knew that at any moment, there could be a knock at his door because he was the presiding leader of the church and they would love to get their hands on him. Yeah. And he was dealing with fear. And so he wrote a letter to Paul who was in prison and said, Paul, I'm in trouble. And when Paul wrote back, he said, Timothy, I'm mindful of your tears. And scholars say that he could see Timothy's teardrops on the parchment that he was reading. Wow. He, he understood how deeply terrified Timothy was. And he said, Timothy, hey, Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear. He was speaking common sense to him. Yeah. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. And likewise, God has not given one of your viewers a spirit of fear. Yeah. And when a spirit of fear operates in you, the Greek word delias, it's really the word for a coward. When you have a spirit of fear, you're afraid to face life. You move into a spirit of retreat, into a mode of self-preservation. Yeah. You're paralyzed, you're incapacitated. But that, you can't live successfully as a Christian like that. And Timothy was a pastor. He couldn't do his job with the spirit of fear. Right. So Paul says, God's given you power, love, and wait, a sound mind. The word sound mind goes back to what we're talking about. It's the Greek word sophronismos, the one the word sozo, you know that word. It means deliverance or salvation. And the word phren is the word for the intellect. It's where we get, they had the old science called phrenology. It's about the mind. Yeah. But when you compound those two words together, the word sound mind, sophronismos, describes a mind that has been delivered and is set free. Wow. So in the new birth, God has given us minds that are delivered. I call it saved brains. <laughs> that's, that's really what we have in Christ. That's right. And the enemy wants to seize it. But as long as we can keep our mind free, we can walk in power and we can walk in love. How do you get set free from a spirit of fear? I mean, can you take authority over it? Like when uh, I, I dealt with fear, this was the main thing I dealt with as a believer and as a pastor was fear, just the, this constant fear. It's debilitating. And so how do, you, how do you overcome a spirit of fear? How did you overcome it? Well, first of all, I had to understand it wasn't me. And one of the things that I say to people is, one of the things that makes the devil so dangerous is stealth, is that he doesn't present himself as the devil. You know, hey, I'm a spirit of fear, and I'm here to attack you and defeat you. It's, it's like it's my fear. This fear, is coming up from within me. And I didn't realize it was, it was not me, it was a spirit. And so when I overcame fear, I had, to, I had to externalize it and I had to begin to speak to it as a separate entity. 
And, and I took authority over it. And li literally, this is how it became a spirit of fear. So I just began to talk to it. And you say, spirit of fear, I expose you. You're, you're not me. I, and I tell people, God didn't make us with fear. He made us with healthy fear. Like, you know, mm -hmm. someone swerves into your lane and you swerve out. It's circumstantial, right. it's temporary, and it's instructive. It's a good fear. But the bad fear is chronic, it's paralyzing, and it's confusing. And it keeps you from doing what God wants you to do. So I just began to talk to it. And, and I just said, I bind you in Jesus' name. I cast you away. I'm not listening to you anymore. You're not, I'm not going to uh, receive your thoughts anymore. And when I did that, Rick, I mean, it was, I wouldn't say it was instantaneous. It took a few days of that at the beginning, and I didn't have any more fear. I mean, that's how, we're, and whenever I began to have that kind of fear, I just realized this isn't from God. This isn't me. This is the devil, and I take authority over it, and it set me free from, from paralyzing fear. Well, the Bible says it's a spirit. It's a spirit of fear. Right. And when fear comes, you can feel it. That's right. You, you know when fear comes in the room. One thing that's helped me personally is the 91st Psalm, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And you know, the only way you're going to abide in the shadow of the Almighty is if you draw very near to the Lord, because if the Lord moves and you don't move with Him, yeah. you step out of His shadow. So the whole implication is draw near to the Lord. And when you are near to the Lord, reading the Word, praying, doing what you got to do, you literally dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. Sickness can't live there. Yeah. Terror cannot live there. Yeah. Psalm 91 says, if you dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, you will not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Those things don't touch you when you're living in the shadow of the Almighty. So I also speak to fear. I rebuke it. I tell it doesn't belong in my life. And I draw near yeah. to get in his shadow because I know that it, it can't function if I'm really living in God's shadow. I love that. So talk about, just in just the last few minutes here, the power of memory. You know, just what happens in our memories and how the devil uses that against us. Well, the memory is one of the strongest weapons we have. You know, you can remember lots of bad things. But Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, you need to call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that you have. Isn't that amazing? He said, you got to call it to remembrance which means you gotta go back, you gotta dig it up, you gotta brush the dirt off of it. We have a way of forgetting very important things. Right. But we need to use our minds to really rehearse the faithfulness of the Lord. And if you'll, you know, when you're looking at a mountain, it looks like you can never get over it. The problem is a bad memory. Because if you'll just put that mountain on pause and turn around and look at your past, You'll remember you faced some really bad mountains in your past. You got over every one of them. You're still here. Yeah. Just a bad memory. But if you will call to remembrance and begin to walk through the faithfulness of the Lord. You know, Psalms tells us over and over, remember the works of the Lord. Remember the works of the Lord. When you begin to walk through every moment in your past, when God has delivered you, when God has saved you, when God has preserved you, by the time that you get up to your current mountain, it doesn't look so big anymore. Yeah, that's exactly In fact, right. it's going to move just like all the others did. And just remembering is really important. If God told us to fast, some people would say, well, medically, I can't fast. If God told us to memorize Scripture, some people would say, well, I have a hard time memorizing Scripture. But everybody can remember. Everybody. Yeah. And if we'll just remember, by the time we get up to the present, whatever we're facing, it doesn't seem so big after all. I love that. Rick, how can people, what is your website where people can come and find out more about your ministry? Just renner.org. It's very simple. Renner.org. And you've got, <clears throat> first of all, Sparkling Gems in the Greek, which I've used as a daily devotional for many years, is a book that- Thank thick. you, Jimmy. It's, it's a fabulous book. And just, you can read it every day. And there's two volumes of that, sold millions of copies all over the world. And so if you don't know anything about Sparkly Gems in the Greek, and Rick has so many books out there, but let me talk about, again, we've been talking today about spiritual weapons to defeat the enemy, overcoming the wiles, devices, and deception of the devil. This is a smaller book that comes from, it's an excerpt from Dress to Kill. This is Rick's That's larger right. book on spirit. Is that right? Spiritual Warfare. And so yeah. th these are fabulous. And also Life in the Combat Zone. Uh, how to survive and thrive and overcome in the midst of difficult situations. 
and I truly mean it when I say, Rick, I've, uh, we've known each other for several years, but we have, I've known of your ministry for many, many years, read your books. You, you are the, my go-to source on many issues, but spiritual warfare uh, especially. But you're, you're an expert in the Greek language, and as you've been talking today, I love listening to you talk because you explain the real meaning of words and just unpack that in the power of the New Testament and the power of what the Bible actually says. So thank you so much for being being with me today. And of course, I want to get you back as often as you can. Now you're in Russia right now, right? This is my studio in Russia. And I want to say thank you for having me. And I want to say thank you to your friends and your partners for supporting your ministry. If you're a supporter of Jimmy's ministry, you're doing a good thing. Keep it up. Thank you, Rick, very much. Well, blessings to you and Denise and to your church there in Moscow, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you guys for tuning in today to The Tipping Point. We hope this has been a blessing to you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.